This meeting is being recorded. Her books uh, have been on Barnes and Noble's top 10 bestseller list. Uh, she has uh, uh, an extraordinary amount of experience writing. I think she indicated that she has, since 1975, has had 400 paid articles, uh, articles, short stories, and poems that have been published. Uh, she is a popular speaker, and hopefully she'll speak a little bit about this because she has uh, actually uh, been uh, a speaker on cruise ships, I, I assume speaking about writing. She has been uh, a finalist for the Agatha Award for Best Mystery, Left Coast Crimes Watson Award for Best Characters, uh, Killer Nashville Silver Falchion Award for Best Suspense. Uh, she has been, she was a teacher for more than 26 years, I believe. Uh, has, enjoys geocaching. I have a friend who loves to do that. Uh, drawing, reading, kayaking, and scuba diving. And her program today is about show, don't tell. And any of us who have been part of our critique group have heard that term a lot. So Elsie is going to talk about uh, how to do that, how to show in your writing rather than just telling. So Elsie, the floor is yours. And as I point out, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, and then I will uh, ask them as we go along. Also, if you look in the chat, you will see that Elsie has, put, has uh, placed her email address there, where she has invited us to ask questions that may be a little more detailed than uh, this format really provides for. Is that correct? That is that? correct. Okay, so Elsie? The floor is yours. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. Now, I always wanted to be the perfect author. So I made sure that I would always show instead of tell. As such, I would write such sentences as, um, I wanted to show anger. So I put, the blood inside her boiled like a volcano ready to erupt. If I wanted to show regret, I put sadness wrapped its tentacles around her, suffocating her like twin sisters of depression and regret. Oh, such wonderful sentences. I made sure my book was filled with all sorts of sentences similar to those. I send it off to my editor. My editor sends me back for revisions and stuff and says, Elsie, this is a wonderful book. Uh, you really have a way of uh, keeping the pace up, of um, using red herrings, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what? You sure have a tendency to tell instead of show. Huh? What happened? I did everything, I showed them, I mean, um, I showed them the blood boiling inside like a volcano ready to erupt. That's showing, no, that's telling. So I decided to study a little bit deeper into this show, don't tell technique. And I wanted to know if there were any signs that show us that we are telling instead of showing. And thankfully for us, there is. There, first of all, there are four ways or four indicators, and these are real easy to spot. So we're gonna go through them like, like this. Uh, first of all, if you use the passive voice, you are telling instead of showing. The passive voice is when you have, this is how we normally speak. You have the subject right here, and then you have the verb. 
the boy hit the ball. Boy is a subject. Um, hit is the verb. If you reverse them and you have the ball was hit by the by the boy, you've reversed it, putting the verb first and then the subject, and that makes it the passive voice. So anytime you're in the passive voice, you're going to be telling instead of showing. Whenever you have information dumps, that's number two. If you have um, the day was like this and this is what happened on that day and it was blah, 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 blah. Anytime you have an information dump, you are going to be telling instead of showing. The same thing as if you use the narrative style. If you have a narrative summary on where you say, well, the first thing my character did was blah, blah, blah. He went to the store and there he met the bad guy. Immediately he recognized him. So he kind of hid behind a shelf and decided he was going to follow him and see where um, that would lead and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anytime you get into a narrative summary like this, you're going to be showing instead. Oops, you're going to be telling instead of showing. If in essence, there's a lack of tension, then that also shows that you're going to be telling instead of showing. Those are the four fast, easy ways to determine if you are in the telling or the showing mode. But Let's dwell now into deeper into this and find out exactly how you can tell if you are telling instead of showing. Number one, if you draw conclusions for the reader, for example, if you say Pedro felt nervous, you're telling the reader how your character is feeling. Whenever you mention an emotion, then you're going to be telling instead of showing. So how can you change that? You would have, Pedro had to keep from giggling like a child at a funeral. Now you can see him. He's standing there kind of like, <laughs> okay. Now you know by his actions that he is nervous. Think about it as if you are doing a television show or a, have a character coming in. The character can't all of a sudden stop and say, oh, I am mad or I'm nervous or I am something. Instead, he has to show it. So he wants to show the anger. So what does he do? He grabs a piece of paper and he wrinkles it and he throws it and he slams the door. Okay, now you go, oh, he's really upset. You've shown it. So think about the emotion. How can you show it? How would an actor show it on television or a movie and get the idea across to the viewer? The same way you get your idea across to the readers. The second way you can tell if you're in the telling mode instead of the showing mode is if you tell the reader what is happening. Um, take, for example, the sentence, there was someone breaking into the house. Okay, what you did is you told them specifically that someone was breaking into the house. You are telling them. And by the way, analyzing that sentence, there was someone breaking into the house. Anytime you begin with there are, there is, there were, it makes for a weak sentence. Simply take those two words out and throw them out. And you have someone broke into the house. Notice how much stronger that sentence is. But it is still telling. How do you show it? You use specific details, such as 
The trap door opened and I and jumped backwards. Dust showered the cardboard boxes that clattered the closet floor. As soon as the ladder thunked down, a black boot stepped onto the top rank, followed by another. And the reader goes, oh, here comes that guy. He's here. And now he's here and Max. And now you have actually put the reader in that scene and you have shown him about this guy breaking into the house without actually having to say he broke into the house. You are showing it. The third way is if you tell the reader how a character feels. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, Rihanna, who happens to be a vampire. And uh, Diana is, uh, you know, David is writing here and here's Brianna and Brianna is coming over and is going to his neck and going to, you know, suck that blood out. And so you have Brianna was hungry for blood and David felt fear and excitement. Okay, you told the reader exactly what's going on. Now show it. Rihanna leaned forward, her eyes fixed on the artery that began to pulse faster as she leaned closer to it. Okay, you see her coming in and you see David's artery going like that. So you know he's, he's afraid, he's excited, he's uh, tense, you know, without ever having to mention those. By using those specific details, you have uh, told Instead, you have shown instead of telling. The fourth way is using dialogue tags. When you use them, chances are you're going to be in the telling mode. A dialogue tag is when you have something like blah, 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 followed by he said angrily, um, he felt happy, he, um, you know, etc., etc. Okay, those are dialogue tags. So you have an example of this guy, they're in a ship called the Phoenix, and uh, somebody says, Herrera was on board, and the character answers, on the Phoenix? Chase said, surprised, what was he doing here? Chase said, surprised, you are telling the reader how he felt, you're in the telling mode. So how can you correct it? There's several ways. Method number one is by using action. Uh, Herrera was on board. On the Phoenix, Chase glanced at the central hologram as if he could somehow confirm the news. What was he doing here? Okay, by him having glanced at it and looking at this hologram and trying to confirm the news, you know that he is surprised without having to tell the readers that. You can also use the character's thoughts. On the Phoenix? He couldn't be. What was he doing here? Okay, he couldn't be. You're inside the character's thoughts and you are showing them exactly what is happening. You can also do it by using dialogue. On the Phoenix, Chase said, what the hell was he doing there? Okay, the way that he says it, it is showing that element of surprise. Now, uh, when you mention an emotion, you're always going to be telling. And here we're going to have a chance to go into deep point of view. When you get out of the telling mode and you use these other methods, you're going into deep point of view and you're becoming a better uh, writer, better way of expressing yourself. For example, um, you would say, she's pretty. Okay, so we now know she's pretty, but how is she pretty? You go into those specific details. She had a small, delicate features like a porcelain doll. Okay, now you see that you are showing the reader what she's really like. 
Now, let's say you want your character to, your character is feeling um, terror and panic. So you write something like this. Terror sized him as he ran as fast as he could. The harder he ran, the more the panic tightened in his chest, swallowing him, making it hard to breathe. And you're having all of these sentences that are showing him in a state of panic. But you know what? The reader is not relating. Why? Because he doesn't understand. Why is he, he knows he's feeling panic, but why? If you can show it to the reader, you are going into deep viewpoint and you're showing him what it's like. Now, for example, um, this is from Every Good and Perfect Being gift by Sharon K. Sosa. Jonathan took Dee Dee to her appointment on Tuesday morning to go over the results of all the lab work while I kept the baby. My stomach churned and the whole time they were gone, I paced like a pent up puppy. Okay. This is a perfect example of using that deep point of view in the showing mode. What emotion is she feeling? She's nervous, she's concerned, she's worried, she's anxious. I'm taking care of the baby while the husband takes my daughter away and they're doing these uh, examinations. They're getting the results of the exams and you see the mother is just kind of, ah, oh, she's like a pent up puppy. Okay, notice how much more emotional, how you can reach the reader in a deeper level. And in that passage, not once was the emotion ever mentioned. Another way you can do this is whenever you use adverbs. Adverbs are normally words that end with L-Y. You're in the telling mode whenever you use those adverbs. You're such a jerk, he said angrily. Angrily that puts you in the telling mode. So how do you show it? Okay, show what it's like to be angry. You're such a jerk. Dan slammed the phone shut and threw it on the couch. The pages ruffled open, the names inside seemingly exposed and vulnerable against the stark black leather. Dan got to his feet, moving so fast his chair skidded against the floor and dented the new drywall. All the specific details are showing his anger. And that's what you'd want to do. Another way is to avoid the B verbs. The B verbs are am, is, was, were, are, be, been, being. Anytime you use any of these eight words, you're going to be in the passive voice, or at least 98% of the time. Now, let's look at an example. You have um, this woman who walks into a room, and the room is exactly the way that it used to be when she was a little girl. And of course, she's kind of like, Whoa, what's going on? Okay, first, in the telling mode. The room was perfect. She saw it and immediately transported back to her childhood because it had all the elements she remembered. All right, now let's take that same scene and put it in the telling, showing mode. She threw open the white oak doors and stepped into a past from 20 years ago. The bedroom she remembered down to the last detail. Pink candy striped walls with white trim. A thick white shack carpet hooked plush maroon velvet chairs flanking silent fireplace. An enormous canopy bed draped the cheer white veil. Linda pressed her hand to her mouth. What were these chances? Another room, just like the one she'd had years ago before she'd grown up and grown out of one space and had brought her happiness. Okay, what we author did in here, took details and showed them to the readers as 
the character Linda is seeing them. She's seeing the canopy bird bed. She's seeing the shack carpets. She's seeing the fireplace. And the reader is right there with her, seeing the same things. Another way to avoid the telling uh, the mode is do not begin with a gerund. A gerund is a verb that ends with ing, such as sing, singing, dance, dancing, love, loving, etc., etc. This also works if you begin with the word as, as. Now, let's look at an example of the uh, telling using a gerund. Rapping at the door, Elaine made her presence known to the people inside the house. Rapping, I-N-G, that's Jared. You're automatically in that telling mode. Now let's change it where we are deleting the Jared. Elaine formed a tight fist with her right hand and pounded on the unforgiving oak. They'd hear her or she'd break her hand, letting them know she'd come to call. Again, the use of specific details is what's going to get you to the telling mode, the showing mode instead of the telling. Notice in that second example, there is a very tight imagery. Um, and again, the same principle is begins with a with the word as. So does this mean that you should never tell, that you should always show? No. There are times when you should tell rather than show. But before we get into the second aspect of the show, don't tell uh, mode, just like on television, we're going to have a commercial. So here it comes, commercial number one. Our host, Steve, wanted me to tell you about a specific job, job that I had, how I ended up with it, and etc. So this is how it turned out. Um, the phone rings, and of course I answer it. And the person on the other side tells me that his cousin had heard me speak at such and such presentation, and he thought I would I did a great job, and he would like for me to uh, do presentations for him. He worked for the Princess uh, Cruise Line, and uh, he said, "Are you interested?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I wouldn't." mind working for the, uh, speaking at the cruise lines, what all this involved. And we started talking back and forth. The whole conversation lasted maybe an hour and a half. And basically what he, the way that it ended was he said, okay, I'm going to send you and one guest. Uh, who do you want? And of course I said, my husband. Okay. He was going to send the both of us on a free five day Caribbean cruise where during the days at sea, I would talk about writing and I would talk about my books. So we went over to this uh, uh, Caribbean princess cruise. And the very first presentation I did was intimidating. When on the very front row, there's a the captain, there's the assistant captain, there is the cruise director, um, there is even the chef was there with his little hat. Um, there was anybody who was anybody, the singers, the dancers, all the performers uh, were, were right in there. And I went ahead and of course I did my presentation and I guess I passed. Because after that, not only did Princess Cruise Line send me on uh, cruises, but so did uh, other cruise lines, other major cruise lines. Uh, they sent me off to the Mediterranean. They sent me to Hawaii, Mexican Riviera, Panama Canal, Alaska, et cetera, et cetera. I did all these presentations while um, during the days at sea. And for this, uh, I got, and my husband got a free cruise. Uh, 
I got to sell my books while I was in the ship. And at the end of the cruise, I picked up a check. Oh, what a horrible job, huh? But somebody has to do it. And all of this was just going great. And then you guessed it. The pandemic came. The cruise line started losing money. So they started cutting things. And of course, one of the first things they cut was these author presentations. They haven't reinstated it. And as far as I know, they don't plan to do so anymore. But you know what? It was really a great experience and a heck of a good time while it lasted. If it ever comes back again, I'll be the first to remind them, hey, I'm still here. Now, typical of television, they don't have just one commercial. They have two commercials. So here comes commercial number two. Number two, I just had a new release out, which is called When Doubt um, Creeps In. This hit the Kindle number one bestseller list for suspense and the number two bestseller for mysteries. But the audio has also just been released, and that's what I want to talk to you about. I am going to raffle an audio of When Doubt creeps in. If you would like to win the audio version of this book, simply email me at lch for Hayden and then author, A-U-T-H-O-R at yahoo.com. I also put it in the chat room so that it's uh, right in there and you can, and you can contact me. You can put in there I would like to win your audio and I will, in a couple of days, say what about two or three days from now, I will take, a hat, put your name in a box, a hat, whatever, and I'll draw a name out and whoever wins, I will contact you and let you know and send you the audio version of the book. But wait, I'm not really into audios. I much really rather have the, the book itself. All right. If you'd rather uh, win the e version of uh, when doubt creeps in, you do exactly the same thing. Or um, I also had another release, which is called uh, the Last Ghost Dance. This is from the Harry Bronson series. This is from the Amy Brandt um, series. So this one is said in an Indian reservation. And uh, a lot of people are really enjoying the fact that it's different, a kind of uh, kind of setting. It's in the Payot Reservation in Nevada. So if you want to win either one of these two books, you can uh, email me and say, I would like to win the e-version of, and then tell me which book. And then I will also put those names in a box, hat, and draw the names out. Can you win? Can you do both? Sure you can. You can um, enter this contest and enter that, enter this raffle and enter that raffle. But if you win from this raffle, then you cannot win from this one. I would simply choose, uh, choose somebody else. Also, I have a handout for this presentation and where I have all the examples and all the stuff that I've been telling you. If you would like to get a copy of the handout, you can also email me at the same uh, email, uh, email address. But like everybody, I'm, uh, I get lots of spam. So on the subject line, you can put Steve's name or you can put Sisters in Crime or your uh, show don't tell or I was attending your presentation or anything that shows me that you are not spam. And I will, of course, um, send you the uh, handouts or enter you in uh, either one of the contests or ruffles or both or do all three. Okay. End of commercials, back into the show. 
So we had said that there are times when you need to show, I mean, you need to tell instead of show. When is it proper to tell instead of show? One, when you're trying to hook the reader, tell them instead of show them. This is from Susan Wiggs, The You I Never Knew. After 17 years, Michelle Turner was going back, back to the past she didn't want to remember, to the father she barely knew, to the town where she grew up too fast, fell in love too hard, and wound up pregnant and alone. Okay, notice how you're going like, oh my gosh, this gal is going back into her hometown where all of these bad things happen. She doesn't even know her family. Uh, you've hooked the reader. You want to know exactly what happens when she goes back into uh, this town. So if you're hooking the reader, tell him, don't show him. If you want to condense long periods of time into a little bit, then you will also want to tell instead of show. This is from uh, my novel, uh, When Doubts Creep In. And in this passage, or in this book, basically, uh, Bronson is a retired detective. Mike is was his partner. He's still active police, but Bronson is retired. When um, all of a sudden, Mike seems to have gone rogue. Everything he does, it takes him deeper and deeper into a world of being a bad cop, a corrupted cop. But Bronson can believe that he's best friend, his ex-partner, his almost brother, would do anything at all. So I'm taking a long time of passage and condensing it into a little bit. This is from When Doubt Creeps In. Mike was a straight arrow. Bronson, on the other hand, was the one who deviated from the rules. Mike was the one who kept him in line. Mike? Doing something illegal? No. That didn't sound like him at all. Okay, I don't have to show the reader that this is what Mike did. This is what Bronson reacted to it. This is what Mike did. I simply took everything that happened and condensed it. Of course, throughout the book, I'm showing Mike doing this bad stuff and I'm showing Bronson's reactions. But in this initial scene, I'm just condensing it to that one particular small passage. Another time you want to tell is when you're introducing an insignificant minor character. Let's say that they're at a restaurant and your main character and somebody else are sitting there and they're talking to each other, you know, blah, 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 like that. And a waiter approaches you. The waiter entered the room. That's it. You don't have to tell me that he was tall, that he was handsome, that he was short, that he had pimples all over his face, that um, he was scratching his head as he came by. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to show now, if this waiter is going to get to the table and take out a gun and point it at them, uh, yeah, then that's completely different. Now he becomes a major minor character. So as long as he remains a minor character, you do not have to use the showing method. You simply tell the reader. Another time, that you want to use the telling method instead of the showing is when you present the backstory. The backstory is when you go back into the character's past to explain a current action. It is similar to a flashback, yet they are completely different. In a flashback, you want to show Sometimes you can even take an entire chapter and tell 
show exactly what happened. Um, my character is acting this way because when he was a child, this and this happened. His mother walked into his room and she did this and the father did that. And the little boy um, did this and that and et cetera, et cetera. So you see how this particular incident is affecting him right in here. You're showing the reader that would be the flashback. But if you are doing a, um, a backstory, then you're taking everything and again, you're making it into a small scene. In this case, you want to tell instead of show. In this passage, again, from When Doubt Creeps In, we see that Bronson has some fake IDs with him. He's got driver's license, he's got uh, visas, he got passports, he got credit cards, he got everything under a different name other than Harry Bronson. So here is uh, the explanation for that. Bronson half smiled. When he and Mike had finished working, that undercover case, Mike had turned in his fake identities. So had Bronson. But Bronson found a way to get them back. When Mike found out what Bronson had done, Mike had scolded him. Bronson had shrugged and told him that it might come in handy one of these days. Looked like now was one of those days. Okay, it doesn't matter uh, how he did it, when he did it, etc. The fact that he has them, that's important. But if the character all of a sudden shows up with, oh, here's a fake ID, here's a fake uh, driver's license, here's a fake credit card, here's a fake, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you go like, oh, where the heck did he get them? So you tell the reader, you just kind of summarize it like I did in that particular passage. If you're introducing a crisis, now remember, a crisis never solves the problem, it only intensifies it. So when you're introducing a crisis, by all means, tell the reader about him. This is from um, Bharati Kitchener's Sharmila's book. I still can't believe I agreed to an arranged marriage. I, Sharmila Seam, a thoroughly modern 32-year-old Chicago-style woman, I wear a power suit by the day, each evenings in a skin tight lycra that my suffering clad mother says are both shameful in the eyes of the gods. Oh, my looks are Indian, all right, you know, big eyes, shoulder length hair, and slender body. But to someone like me, a second generation American who speaks broken Hindi with a Midwestern accent, India is pretty much of a mystery. I'm almost the last person I'd expect to marry an up-and-coming young executive in New Delhi, 10,000 miles from Chicago, Lake Shore Drive. Okay, she's introducing a crisis. What is that crisis? There's this modern Indian woman in Chicago who works like her, and she wears, um, what's, uh, what's the other thing she wears? And she wears... Uh, skin tight lycra and uh, power suits and now she's going to go into India where of course she would never ever do anything like this and she's going to go there to an arranged marriage you know something's going to give so you use the telling mode instead of the showing because you're introducing a crisis. Now, there are times when you want to use both the telling and the showing. Uh, if you want to heighten the effect, you want to use both. Let's say you are describing um, a building. You want to say uh, it was tall and had uh, two oak doors or a revolving door. Um, the grass outside was prime or it was filled with weeds or, you know, whatever. You are showing the reader via details what this building is like. But 
if it tells you how this building affects you, then you switch to the telling mode. The building look as if, and the windows in the building look as if eyes were staring at me. That's a reaction that will put it in the telling mode. Here's an example. The flowers bloom in cascading shades of color. The sun's rays bathe them in light, filling the garden with intoxicating fra fragrance. I was enchanted by their presence. The first two sentences are in the telling, in the showing mode. You're showing that the flowers are blooming in all sorts of different colors. You see the sun rays coming down and it's filling it with an intoxicating fragrance. Then you go to the third sentence and you switch to telling. I was enchanted by the presence. So you, how you reacted is the telling and the showing is the details about the specific events. A combination of telling and showing always gives more meaning to a character's experience. It adds depth to the story. So always use both the showing and the telling, but limit the use of the telling. Notice I said, limit the use of the telling, not delete it. Any questions or comments? Okay, um, can you hear me okay now? No. I can hear you. Uh, I haven't seen any questions posted. Does anybody have any questions out there for Elsie? What, if I could, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your writing and what can you tell us a little bit about the books that you write. I know you've written two series and one standalone. So tell us a little bit about them and why you chose series and why you chose one standalone. Well, the first one was the Harry Bronson series. I first wrote a story, it was called, uh, my very first book, in fact, was called Who's Susan? And I said, I'm not going to have the character be the main character, or I am going, or the detective be the main character. I'm going to have Susan be the main character. And Bronson is just going to come in and appear here and there and, and kind of help out the, the main character. Well, when the book came out, I got a lot of comments like, Elsie, this is really good. And I really fell in love with Bronson. Why don't you write a book where Bronson is the main character? Well, I said, yeah, I don't want to do that. And I wrote the second book, same comment, same comment. So, you know, I guess I'm a little bit dense. So I finally said, okay, I will write series about Brunson. And so though I have those four books in the background, the very first book was called Why Casey Had to Die. And that's where I started out with a series. The second series that I write is the Amy Brandt uh, mystery. She's a reporter uh, based in Lake Tahoe in Nevada. And the reason I chose to write her series was because I wanted to keep Brunson fresh. If I wrote Brunson, 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 eventually I would start using the same plot, the same ideas, the same something. So I introduced a new series, a brand new character. This way I could do Bronson, Amy, Bronson, Amy. And that's why I did that one. Then I decided I have a little bit too much of Bronson, too much of Amy, and I decided to do a standalone, and that's where, where that one came in. But that's why I decided to do a series instead of uh, just regular standalones. Okay. A uh, couple of questions from our chat room. Um, who are your favorite writers who do showing really well as opposed to telling? Um, when you go to the... 
the classic uh, writers, modern day classic, Harlan Corbin, um, does a beautiful job of uh, showing instead of telling. You can really get into his uh, into his his thing. Uh, so I would say he's one of my favorites. Uh, there are a lot of other ones that, of course, just can't uh, names don't pop up uh, right now. But uh, best thing to do is read the books and analyze them don't read them as readers read i mean uh, read them instead as a writer you're going along you see a passage and you go whoa that's good stop and analyze it is he telling is he showing what techniques is he using uh, question a uh, couple of questions on this point uh, do you plot out everything happens or do you write and see what happens? And someone else asks the question in the form of the very simple, are you a pantser or a plotter? I am definitely a pantser. Um, when I teach writing, when I do presentations, I always do it with plotter as a mind. Always plot your novels because What's going to happen? You're going to do blah, blah, blah. Then you're going to get right here. And then you're going to have a writer's block. And then you're going to give up. So for new authors, beginning authors, um, inexperienced authors, I would say go the plotter route. But as for me, I always am a pantser. I start here. I know how the book is going to end. How I get there, it's, of course, it's going to entail a lot of back writing. Because all of a sudden I have this and I go, oops, I should have foreshadowed that. So I have to go back over here and oops, I should have put a red herring about this. So I have to go back. And of course, that writer's block really comes in and I have to say, oh, now what? You know, so I wouldn't advise you to be a pantser until you have X amount of experience and you know exactly where you're going and how how to get there. But I love being a prankster because I love being surprised. Sometimes I'm writing down and I go, whoa, you know, that really shocked me, which I'm sure is going to shock the reader too, but that's why I'm a pantser. Okay, well, let me ask you, but when you say you're a, a pantser, uh, you do have the idea, and usually when I have been writing, uh, I usually have the story comes full blown at least in terms of how it begins and how it ends so when you're thinking of the story even though you're a pantser you know the ending before you start writing yes okay. it's kind of like if you plan a trip to new york you're going to start here and you know you're going to get there but how are you going to get there can you go via california all the way to new york down to florida up to new york or how are you going to get uh, to it. You know the beginning, you know the end, even though sometimes the ending can change because you could say so-and-so is the bad guy. And as you're writing along, you go, ooh, ooh, so-and-so is not the bad guy. And then you have to change your ending and it's okay to do that. But at least you have a path that you need to follow. Okay. Uh, do you write in first person or third person? Third person. Okay. I think it is more, um, more, I don't know, it, I can relate to the characters a lot better. I do switch to first person whenever I'm in their thoughts. And of course, everybody, um, everybody does that. But mostly it's, it's third person that I write on. Okay, because one of the people who ask a question says, it seems like writing in the first person promotes rampant use of to be verbs as passive voice is that the do you think that's the nature of first person or is not well it can be avoided for example you could say i was sitting at the table when mike walked in okay you could say i sat at the table the door opened and mike stepped in now you avoided the passive voice but you're still in the first person. So yes, you do have a tendency to use the be verbs more, but you need to be more aware of them and delete them wherever possible. Okay. Um, and this is a frequent 
question when we have uh, people who are, are authors speak to us, which is most of the time, a uh, frequent question about uh, technology that you might use or not use. In fact, uh, you may have joined us when we were talking about uh, whether we're going to have a program on AI, artificial intelligence or not. Um, but the question here is, do you write your first draft in Word, Scrivener, Longhand? Do you have something else? What? How do you physically go about writing the story? And, and if you want to, do you have a regular schedule or do you just fit it in when you can? When I was teaching, I wrote everything longhand. Everything was in blue ink. When I did the revisions, it was in red ink, you know, typical teacher. Um, and I always wrote in the morning. So while the house was still quiet, then I got up and made breakfast and got the kids ready for school. And I went to school, came back and did family stuff, uh, put the kids to bed. And then I wrote, then I retired. And my new schedule is I write in the mornings and I write in the nights, but I am getting to be more of a modern Elsie and I've given up my pen and pencil. Now I actually write everything in Word and I'm even doing more writing during the day than I am at the morning and the night like I did when I first started, uh, when I first retired. I like to uh, write any time that I can. So I still carry a pen and pencil with me so that if I'm standing on a line at the grocery store and it's an extra long line, I just take out my little notebook and I start, I start writing and then I transfer everything into my, into my computer. But basically I'm, I'm a computer. I'm, I'm a modernized person now. I, uh, one, one last question. Um, and uh, cause we're getting up toward one o'clock here. Uh, but one last question I like to ask uh, writers is who are, well, two, I have two last questions. We'll start with this one. Uh, who do you read? Who do you like? Who do you think are, do you read for enjoyment? And who do you read to sort of study how they write? Actually, I'll read just about anybody right now. I'm in a kick of um, trying out lesser known authors, uh, people whose normally books are not the bestsellers, and I'll read them. And, but I will read first, second, third chapter. If I'm not captured by them, pew, throw that book out and try somebody else. And you'd be surprised just how many wonderful new voices are out there that haven't gotten a chance to be exposed to the writing field. So I always try to leave Amazon reviews and uh, do anything that I can to promote or mention them maybe in my Facebook page or in, in my newsletter and stuff. But that's what I'm doing right now. I am reading, quote, uh, new readers and readers that are uh, I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with. Well, we, we can offer you three or four suggestions. I think we have... Michael Dabney, who's not with us today, wrote a great detective story. Uh, Diana Catt uh, has a book, and she's the president of our club and has a book out The is uh, The Death Map, I think, if I got the name correct. Diana, please correct me. Uh, and of course, I, you know, I have my own more recent book called uh, Last Train to Stratton. So we'll give you some, a reading list here. That would be perfect. I'd love it. Uh, and uh, one other thing I always like to ask uh, to finish up an interview, but what are you working on now? What's in the future for Elsie? I am doing the next Harry Bronson novel. Uh, in this one, Harry's uh, niece gets kidnapped and... Um, that's where he, that's basically where it is. So I know she gets kidnapped and I know everybody lives happily ever after. And that's about it. I thought I knew who the um, kidnapper was, but now as I keep writing, I know that, no, that's not right. So I'm still kind of hmm, about it, but that's where, that's what I'm doing next. It's the next Harry Bronson novel. Excellent. Excellent. Look forward to it. Uh, there are uh, 
thanks in the uh, in the chat room to you for an excellent presentation. And I personally want to thank you so much for being uh, a guest here for your presentation, uh, for a great presentation about uh, things that uh, we may not have thought of about show, uh, don't tell. Uh, if uh, we want the, do you have materials for this? I, I do. That right. Um, I have all and, the handouts for this presentation, like I would say, and as an example, and then I would read the example and stuff. I have all of that. Plus I have everything in a, like in an outline form that comes from being a teacher. So I have everything in an outline form and I would be glad to share that with anybody. All I do is just give me your email and um, I'll send you the, the handouts. Okay. And again, just so everybody knows it is in the chat room, but because everybody has moved on uh, from the chat room, um, it uh, is LCH author mm -hmm. at yahoo.com. Correct. I am going to also uh, just repost that. Uh, no, I just screwed up here. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to give me a second here, copy that and repost it. There we go. So I just reposted it in the chat room if anybody wants to copy that and then send you a request for the uh, presentation materials and make oh. sure that uh, you put a tag on it saying something like Speed City, Sisters in Crime, or uh, request for materials, something like that. Yeah, anything that shows you're not uh, spam. And then don't forget also the raffle for the uh, audio or for the ebooks. Then that's also something that we do for you. Okay, excellent, outstanding. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And uh, without any more questions, we'll call the meeting to an end. Thanks so much, Elsie. Thank you. It was absolutely wonderful. You all have a great day. It was great from this standpoint. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.